Hello, my name is David McLemore. I'm the professor of tuba and euphonium at Central Washington University. And in this video, I'm going to talk about the euphonium audition materials for the upcoming 2020 WMEA uh, All-State Honor Ensembles. Think of this video as a mini lesson. Uh, essentially, I'm going to talk through each track that you need to record, and I'm going to play each track. So you have, for each track that you're going to record, you have a clear concept of how to approach it and what it should sound like. Uh, now before we talk about the four tracks, let's, let's go through some general tips for success in this audition and just in general as a musician. First of all, don't procrastinate. Uh, make, really start working on these materials now because if you aren't, somebody else who's going to take this audition is going to be working on these right away. Give yourself as much lead time as you can to really, for each of these four tracks, to put the best musical product together that you can. Uh, you know, really set yourself up for success. Another thing that not procrastinating will help with is it gives you more time to arrange recording details. I would strongly encourage you, record on the best equipment available. Um, I know that it's very tempting just to take a smartphone, stick it on a music stand, hit record, and there you go. Don't do that. Take the time, talk to your band director, music director, choir, orchestra director. Take the time to set up, um, you know, get, get into a band room or an orchestra room or a, maybe even like a performing arts center, someplace with a really good quality microphones. Uh, you know, take the time to set that up um, and record there with better quality microphones. Um, it's going to help you put your be a better foot forward and increase the chances of you getting into the ensemble. Another thing to bear in mind, and this is true just as a general rule, use the metronome and tuner as practice aids. They are your friend. Um, whether or not you're playing in time, in rhythm, and whether or not you're playing in tune, um, these are objective truths. So much of music is subjective, but whether you're playing with the beat or not, um, that's a yes or no question. Are you in time? Yes or no. Are you in tune? Yes or no. So we want to make sure that we're always in time and in tune. It's just foundational. Um, it's, 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 it's highly important, whether you're playing a song or a dance. So Take a metronome. I encourage students to get something like this chord, which is a metronome and tuner. Uh, take the time, to make the investment, and make this your friend. Use this in the practice room every day. A couple more details. Uh, whenever you see a term in music that you don't know, take your pencil, because you should have one, look it up, look up the term for its definition, and then write that into music. We're going to encounter a couple of terms. In, in these tracks that you'll want to know because th these terms are not just thrown in there the composers are like this will mess them up you know they're not there to mess you up if you're sight reading or to make you think what does that mean they're meant to inform your performance to help you play in a correct style so if you don't know a term look it up and then you'll know it lastly um, and this applies particularly to tracks three and four which are movements from solo pieces listen to the music you know, if you're playing an excerpt from a symphony, or if you're playing, in this case, solo sonata movements, listen to what the piece sounds like with the accompaniment. Listen to how your part relates to everything else that's going on. Listen to how, you know, the, the book, tracks three and four were originally written for different instruments. Listen to how it sounded on the original instruments, and then try to make it sound like that on euphonium. Um, so, again... Listening to music is always a good thing, helping to inform your performance. The first track that you're going to need to record is a chromatic scale from F at the bottom of the bass clef staff up to B flat above middle C and then back down to low F. This is the first example of your playing, so it's really important that you make a good first impression. So, what should you do? First of all, keep the rhythm precise and exact. It's very easy to let imprecise rhythm slip in on this scale because it's just all quarter notes and then a the half note at the end which should be twice as long as the quarter notes. It's very easy to start letting your quarter notes compress or expand. So again, 
practice with a, I would encourage a subdivided metronome, you know, at 144, you know, 72 basically on half notes or on, on eighth notes. One and two and one and two and. Um, play with the metronome and make sure that it's really precise and in time, even though it's rhythmically very simple. On every single note, strive to make your best sound. Now, brass instruments are what's called acoustically reflexive. We really, they're essentially metal amplifiers. So on every single note of this scale, from the bottom to the top, back down, try to fill the room with your sound. Maximize the airflow across the lips at all times. Try to move as much air as you can through the instrument without overblowing the instrument, without the sound spreading or getting edgy. Um, we start in the low register, we move through the middle register into the upper register. So we're in both extremes, high and low register on this track. Avoid tensing up or pinching uh, in the upper register, but also in the low register. Avoid pinching to try to force that low F to start, to, to sound right at the beginning. Um, the lips have to vibrate freely, kind of like how on a string instrument. The strings have to vibrate as freely as possible. The bow across the string is what's creating the sound, or the finger, in the case of pizzicato. It's the breath for us brass players. you got to let the air and the wind drive the lips. The lips have to vibrate as freely as possible, so avoid pinching as you play. Um, notice that we have a tempo and an articulation style indicated, but we do not have a dynamic indicated. So, what should we do? I would encourage you to play it at a comfortably loud dynamic, mezzo forte to mezzo forte plus. Now, to achieve this, in order to play louder, we have to increase our airspeed. And in order to play softer, we have to decrease our airspeed. So not only should you maximize the airflow across the lips on every single note of the scale, I want you to default to fast wind. Try to move air that is fast and full of energy. You know, um, that will help these notes respond. Now again, we talked about this, I talked about this a second ago, knowing what terms mean in music. Legato, this is an articulation designation. Basically what it means is that we want bricks of sound. We want the fronts of notes to be smooth but clear, and then we want to sustain the sound through the body of the note, kind of like a tenuto also. So rather than using a letter T, at the front of our articulations, rather than going ta or to, you're going to use the letter D, da, do, on every single note. Um, and that will give you rhythmic definition of where the note starts, but it won't pop out the way that using our default articulation of a letter T, that tends to pop a little bit more, and D doesn't quite have that pop to it. So use a letter D articulation, da or do, depending on which vowel shape you prefer. Lastly, when you're playing this, strive not just for your best sound, but for the most stable sound you can make. Think of like a dial tone. Now obviously we don't want to sound like chord or tuner here, but we do want to have that regularity of pitch. The sound's not wavering, it's not going flat or sharp, it's a dial tone. We want to try and mimic that as we play. So really strive when you play each note, keep it in tune and keep it there, dead center. Keep the air moving steadily across the lips. Like, like again, think of bricks of wind for every single note. The second track that you're going to need to record is a selection from the Arbenz method, originally for trumpet, but 
the method has been adapted for trombone, euphonium, tuba, virtually all brass instruments. It's the characteristic study number one, an excerpt from it, the first section. So first things first, I want to say, take a quick second to talk about the Arvins. This is a great book. Um, some people have referred to it as the Brass Player's Bible. If you don't own it, I would strongly encourage you to buy it and make it a part of your daily regimen. Um, obviously, you know, I'm a college teacher, you know, I'm a professional player. I still find new things to work on in my playing in the Arvin's book. So it's literally a book that you will never really be done with. There's always more that you can do with it. For euphonium players, um, the cheaper option is the Carl Fisher edition. Uh, looks like this. Uh, but there's a newer version. Uh, 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 Joe Alessi and Dr. Brian Bowman came up with this. Um, this is an updated version. It's a little less faithful to the original Arvids method, but they added some new stuff, which is very cool. Um, you would do well with either version of the book, but I would strongly encourage you to invest in it. Um, so, getting to this characteristic study number one that you need to record. First of all, strive to make this technical etude sound as effortless as possible. It's very easy to make technical music sound hard with a very tense forced sound as we pinch our lips. You want to try and retain your best sound that you already exhibited in the chromatic scale. You want to try and copy that here. Even though this is easily the hardest thing you're going to play. This entire of the four tracks. Track two is easily the hardest. So I would encourage you to spend the most time prepping track two. Uh, another tip, play all of the ink. Notice how specific Arvin is. There's accents, there's dynamics, there's some notes are slurred, other notes are articulated. You have crescendos and decrescendos. We have trills and grace notes. Um, there's so much going on here and you want to make sure that every single marking, whether it's a dynamic, an articulation, a trill, whatever, you want to make that audible and discernible to the listener. Um, bear in mind Another tip, that the tempo is negotiable here. It is marked at Allegro Moderato equals 96. So you're going to be in this ballpark. This is the goal. That's the goal you want to aim for. But you may find that you can't quite get it up to 96. All of you should start at a slower tempo. Start it at least at like 80, if not closer to like 72 or 69 or 60. You know, start at a slower tempo. Make sure that you're really hitting all of the notes, all the right notes with all the right articulations, all the accents, everything, and then speed it up to 92. You may find that you can't quite get it to 96, and that's okay. We would rather hear it the tempo, again, is slightly negotiable. We would rather hear it a little bit under tempo with better musicality, with clearer dynamic changes, really speeding up the air through the uh, ascending crescendos and really slowing the air down as we come down through the day crescendos. We would rather hear it be more musical, even if the tempo is not exactly right, with a better tone. Um, like, alternately, you may find that in order to make the breathing work, you actually have to play a little faster than 96. Um, so... You know, again, it's it's negotiable. Play it at a tempo which is as close to 96 as you can get it, but allows you to make music with it. Because again, this shouldn't sound hard. This should sound acrobatic, energetic, not please, please make it stop. Don't sell that to the listener. Um, speaking of breathing, I mentioned that earlier, that's probably the biggest challenge here. So the question is, where do you breathe? So here are some suggestions. First of all, there are a couple of breathing points which I think are just pretty straightforward. One of which is written in the music. Measure five, right after that B flat downbeat, there's that little comma. That's a breath mark. So breathe after the downbeat of measure five. That's a, that's a good one. Uh, you see these trills going into measures six and seven? I would argue that you should resolve the trills on beat four of measure five and measure six. And then breathe before the grace notes. You can breathe before those grace notes, which will come before the beats. The grace notes in this context are going to come leading into the downbeat. They're going to come before the beat. Um, but you can breathe before you take those grace notes. 
Um, now, that's only three breaths that I've told you, and this is 12 measures, almost 13 measures of music. So where else do you breathe? Where do you breathe in measures 8 to 12? This is where you have a choice, and it'll be determined by your tempo. If you're on the slow side of 96, if you're closer to 92 or 88, you may be able to sneak breaths, take sniff breaths through your nose, or just very quick breaths between 16th notes in this running passage, kind of going from measure 7 and 8 to the end. Um, alternatively, what you may end up doing is dropping individual notes. So for example, if you look at measures 10 and 11, uh, one common thing that people will do is drop the low B flat on the uh of beat two. One E and a two E and ah uh, three. The, that low B flat that goes into the A on beat three, sometimes people will just drop that low B flat out and take a breath there. Um, alternatively, if you can make go another two beats, you can also drop in measure 10 that last A natural, that pick up in the B flat, uh, the high B flat. One E and a two E and a three E and a four E and one E and a two. And so you may find that you drop one or two notes just to get a breath in there. Um, that's the calculation you have to play. I mean, ideally you play every single note. Um, and maybe if we were playing this on trumpet with the air, you know, needing half as much wind, maybe you could do that with just one or two breaths at the places we already talked about. But breathing is difficult on this one, so you may need to either sneak little sniff breaths between 16th notes or drops individual 16th notes. So the third track that you need to record is a movement, uh, the first movement of Galliard's Sonata Number no. 1 uh, for bassoon. This is a nice lyrical piece. In fact, that's what cantabile means, um, which is one of those terms we sometimes need to look up if we don't know what that means. Cantabile means a lyrical, smooth, song-like style. So even though this is a sonata for bassoon, Essentially, Galliard wanted the, the bassoon, in this case, but now euphonium, to play in the manner of a vocalist, which has implications for, you know, how we're going to approach this. First thing we want to bear in mind, no, look at all these slur marks. You know, like in the first measure, you have from the high E down to the A on, on beat three, you have that big slur mark. Um, and then another big slur mark that starts on the last end of the first measure going through the second measure. Those are not actually slurs. Those are what we call phrase marks. So uh, basically they, they can constitute musical sentences. So this tells us that we don't necessarily want to slur everything. We do want to observe the actual slurs. You'll see the little slurs underneath the big phrase marks. Do those slurs, blow through them without tonguing. But as a general rule on this, you actually are going to want to use a legato or tenuto tongue, kind of like the chromatic scale. We want defined note fronts, but we want to keep it smooth and lyrical, like a singer would sing it. A clear, soft attack followed by constant airflow. Um, now again, use these markings, these phrase markings, to your advantage. Each phrase or gesture in a piece of music, it's a musical sentence. And as with spoken language, when you're saying something, usually there's a point to a sentence, there is a goal. So within each gesture, find the note or notes that you're aiming towards. Where am I gonna slightly crescendo into and then decrescendo afterwards? Where's, where's the goal? So with each of these gestures, try to identify the most important note. Another particular element that you need to be aware of here is terrace dynamics. Notice all the dynamic contrasts here. And notice how we have these uh, sometimes extremes of dynamics going from piano, mezzo piano, mezzo forte, suddenly, you know, 
mezzo forte suddenly the pianissimo on the last line. Um, these are what we call terrace dynamics. So in addition to crescendos and decrescendos, where we gradually speed up or slow down the air, with terrace dynamics, think of it like a Mario level. We go from playing very loud to suddenly playing very soft with no preparation. The air suddenly goes much faster or much slower across the lips. So you want to really bring out both, not just the crescendos and decrescendos within each phrase, um, you also want to bring out between the phrases these huge shifts from loud to soft to medium loud to medium soft to loud. You know, bring those out. It's almost a little bit schizophrenic, but we want to we want to emphasize that. Um, also, for, something to bear in mind for a Baroque or classical style. Notice we have grace notes here, just like we saw in the Arbens on track two. But unlike the Arbens here. In the grace notes, for example, in measure 5, measure 12, measure 14, we're going to place those grace notes on the beat, not before. Da, 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 you know, so, for example, um, going into measure 5, and da, ba, da, da, and 1, 2, or 1, and da, ba, da, da. So, the, the, um, on 1, on that downbeat, we're not playing the written F, we're playing the grace notes going into F. So for a Baroque piece, the ornamentation, place the, uh, the grace notes on the beat. Another thing you may want to consider on cadences that come at the end of um, particular uh, phrase gestures, uh, particularly on repeated material, you may want to consider adding ornamentation. For example, trills. Um, an example of this might be uh, at the very end of the piece, um, because notice how essentially measure 14 going into 15 is essentially a rep kind of a repetition of 12 going into 13, with the slight difference being there's a dynamic change there, but it's basically the same written music. Well, the second time in measures 14 going into 15, you might add a trill on that last uh, B natural on beat 4 of measure 14. Um, as, and you wouldn't necessarily do that the first time. So sometimes it's something you might consider. It's, it demonstrates that you know Baroque performance practice. Uh, if you do do a trill, make sure that you start not on the written note, but on the note above. Lastly, we talked a little bit about vibrato in the chromatic scale, and I said not a great place to show your vibrato because we just want to hear that dial tone consistency of sound. Here's a great place to use some vibrato. This is a great place to let your vibrato off the chain to really show that on notes that you want to emphasize that you can get that vibrato going, that lip and jaw vibrato. Basically, as you're blowing across the lips, the bottom teeth, that bottom jaw are just going to move down a little bit. And because your bottom lips are anchored, on your teeth and your bottom jaw, it pulls your embouchure apart ever so slightly and it creates that subtle variance in, in, in intonation that creates the vibrato. Um, two approaches to vibrato to be aware of. I sometimes think about vibrato as saying like wah 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 while blowing. So like blowing across an aperture and then going wah wah wah. Alternatively, uh, a lot of people I respect talk about thinking like ya ya ya, so thinking about more like back here, like a letter Y, ya 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 as you're blowing. So you can think about wah wah, like W at the front, or Y, ya ya ya, kind of at the back. Whichever works better for you, I would try both ways, see which is more comfortable, see which sounds more like a, 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 a controlled uh, vibrato. And then on notes that you want to bring out and decorate, add some vibrato to them.
that you're going to need to record is another Baroque bassoon uh, sonata, this time by Telemann, and it's uh, the second movement of his bassoon sonata in uh, F minor. So there's a saying that all music is either dances, the songs or dances. So the galliard you just recorded was definitely a song. This is definitely a dance. So make note of the expressive markings. Spiritoso estacato a tempo maturato, which is a lot. Essentially what that means is it needs to be spirited and staccato, moderate tempo between 120 and 132. So you notice there's a lot of slurs in this music, but no staccatos, which is odd because staccato is literally, staccato mean kind of lifted, not short. Staccato doesn't mean short, it means lifted or bouncy. Um, it's funny for staccato to be in the expressive marking, but there's no staccato indications. This is why we need to know what these terms mean, because if you didn't know what staccato meant, you might just play all the non-slurred notes, regular articulations, full value. On this piece, any articulated eighth note should be staccato. It's just not written. Rather than writing in all those staccatos on all those eighth notes that are not slurred, you just put staccato in the expressive marking and you just save yourself a bunch of time. It's kind of an efficiency thing. That being said, there are quarter notes, measure 14, beat 3, last three notes of the piece. These should not necessarily be staccato, these should be full length. So, as I said a moment ago, this is more of a dance. This is not as much of a song. So, it's always important to be rhythmically precise on all of this music that you're recording. But here especially, really make the metronome your friend and try to uh, bring out the bouncy staccato notes. Really try to be as metronomically and rhythmically precise as possible. Because this is a dance, we want that steady thumping rhythm uh, when you play a dance. Um, terrace dynamics, it's another Baroque piece, so we have more terrace dynamics here, so really bring out those sudden changes, as well as the gradual ones. Bring out the crescendos and decrescendos. You don't have as many uh, crescendos and decrescendos this time, so as you'll hear me do, you are gonna need to go through and decide where the crescendos and decrescendos should be. And this is something where listening to recordings of the Telemann will help you. Recording, listening to recordings and seeing what other performers, other bassoon players do, uh, and then, you know, finding what you like and copying it. You know, that's a good approach for this. Uh, but again, for the terrace dynamics where it goes from suddenly loud to suddenly soft like an echo, um, sudden immediate changes in how fastly or slowly you are blowing across the lips. Um, to aid this rhythmic approach, always bear in mind agogic accents. Now agogic accents is kind of refers to kind of this relative strength of downbeats versus upbeats. And we, you know, in, in two, four time, beat one is always stronger than beat two. In, in three, four, you know, beat one is strong, beat two and three are weaker beats that drive back into the next downbeat. And all the upbeats always drive into the next downbeat. So really keep that in mind. Almost like there's a lot of passages, measures 4 and 5, 22, 23, where we have these upbeats, slurred upbeats resolving into the, ne into the next downbeat, and those should always drive forward. You'll hear it when I play it. Those should always have a lot of forward energy. Um, last, piece of last piece of advice I would have for this is um, air on the side of a faster tempo. If you can, it's going to create more energy. Well, thank you very much for watching. Um, I wish you the best of luck 
on the upcoming audition. I hope this video has been helpful to you to help you play these tracks uh, better. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. You can contact me at the contact info.